welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, Simon Barr from Realtree is shooting large black birds. First, how important is it that your shotgun fits you? We find out on a simulated game day in Hertfordshire. There are as many reasons for missing a bird as there are for hitting one, but today we want to redress the balance. William Powell Gunmakers has chosen a deep flowing drive on the Hexton Estate in Bedfordshire to show off their range of side-by-sides and over and unders. It's a free try before you buy day. We're hosting an event today because it's a great opportunity for, for visitors to come along and try and use our guns. A gun is a, a big investment to people, you know, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving at first, but plenty of people buy guns for £10,000 without, you know, without, without trying them. On hand are some of this traditional gun maker's gun room staff to ensure these very smart guns fit you like a glove. Who knows how many shotgun owners are out there with ill-fitting 12 bores. Imagine if Beckham wore boots two sizes too big for him. He wouldn't be a shooting god and neither will you be if you're not comfortable. People might come into the gun room, they pick up a gun, I've just got one of the, one of the pals here, um, they close it up in the gun room, it's all, all empty and they'd just close it up and they'd mount it. And it's very easy for you in that full situation when you're not shooting, you're not under pressure, to mount a gun and you make your body fit the gun. Um, and you fundamentally do lots of different things to make you fit the gun. Um, for instance, with this gun, if I put my hand just a bit further along the stock, along the barrel, sorry, and all I do is when I mount this gun, if I mount it up, you can clearly see now that my, my head is very far back on the stock. The stock looks massively long for me. Not changed the gun at all, place my hand down on the action, mount the same gun, and suddenly to get my eyes in the right position, I've suddenly, my nose is right up on top of the gun, and the gun again, the stop length is wrong for me, totally wrong. All I need to do, and coincidentally this gun does actually fit me, put my hand where it should be on the middle of the forehand um, with an over and under, and if I just mount it there, it's virtually in the right sort of place. Um, and, and the difference is, is depending on where you mount the gun and how you falsify it, you can make it fit you, unfit you, and do whatever you want. This is the first time the old English gun maker has done this sort of thing and it has attracted guns from near and far. Mark Bladen and his friend are on familiar territory. They shoot the simulated and the game days offered here at Hexton. Mark's in the market for a new William Powell Pegasus. Come back today because the, the offer of, um, of, of having the gun completely fitted for you and measured um, seemed um, too good to be true. So it was very important to come here and, um, and get a gun fitted, made to measure. Matthew now takes Mark through the process of ensuring his William Powell doesn't just look try. beautiful, but fits beautifully Probably too. Needs to be a little bit lower there. Yeah. I'm, 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 a, I'm seeing... Yeah, I, mean, I can see all of your eye. Yeah. It's the honest truth. I can see all of it and just a bit underneath. Yeah. So what I'll probably do is I'll just, just bring the comb down a little bit for you. No, that looks about right to me. That's perfect. I can see all of your eye. The stock used for the fittings can be pushed and pulled in all directions. The size of our chest, face, shoulders all need to be taken into consideration. So if you've gone up a neck size from 16 to 18 inches, your gun won't fit you quite as well as it once did. These guys cannot stress the importance enough of a well-fitted gun, so why not grab your unloaded shotgun, stick yourself in front of a mirror and see if you are moulding yourself to your gun or whether the gun moulds to you. Right, we're going to look at the four movements in which we can move the gun. We're looking at the length, the bend, the height of the comb and the cast. First of all, we're going to look at the length of the gun, and on the tri-gun, we can alter this by altering these screws and this. So what I'm going to ask Andrew to do is, first of all, just, just mount the gun up into the sky, and we'll have a look at the length. Right, whilst we're looking at Andrew at the moment, he's got his hand in a reasonable position in the middle of, his, middle of the forehand. Um, but if we come back round here, and we look at his positioning of, his, of the back of his hand to his nose, we can probably fit three, possibly four fingers in. The, the perfect length we're looking at is, is probably to fit two fingers in. So if Andrew dismounts the gun now, and what I'll do is I'll just um, undo these and shorten the stock. So if you just mount the gun up again, Andrew, let's have a look, see where you are. Okey dokey, yep, no, that looks about right. If we just, just pop in, we can see we've got two fingers. Andrew just moves his head forward, a better position of his head, and we can see he's got two fingers um, width between, the, between the, the back of his hand and his thing. 
Next we're going to look at the bend of the stock. So if Andrew just moves his hand there, we can see that the, the stock is coming down on this angle and what it creates is, is different lengths from the trigger pull to the, what we call the mid, the toe and the heel of the, of the gun. And this, this truly goes back to the actual shape of your shoulder to your, to your breast and as you can see mine is, is relatively fat but a larger person may have one that's more sloping um, so what I'll just do on this is just ask Andrew to mount it up and see if it fits nicely into this curve of his shoulder. If you just dismount it a minute, Andrew, and do that up, we can actually see what's going on. So as we can see there, if I just come round and ask Andrew to just let go with his left hand, keep it there, we can see that, he, that the, the, the flat of the stock there is perfectly in line with his shoulder. If he was a little bit larger, it would, it would be tucked in and we'd have a gap at the top. If he was much smaller, the opposite would happen and we'd have a gap at the bottom. So we can tell that that is a, a sort of perfect bend length for Andrew. Thirdly, we will we'll go on to look at the cast. Andrew um, is, a, is a right handed shot, as we can see by the way he's mounting the gun. And typically a right handed shot will have cast on or off. Um, as I know Andrew, he's a right handed shot, shoots with both eyes open and shoots with a dominant right eye. I know that he, he will roughly be around um, an eighth cast off on the gun. Um, so um, I already know that this gun is, is cast off to that. And what we can do is go back to my demonstration earlier um, of when we're looking, the gun is empty, is all we do is look down the end of the gun um, and I can see that the, there's a slight curve on the cast of the gun as I look down, it's the left-hand side, and that tells me that it's cast off. When we're looking at the, the height of the comb, what we do is we measure back from the, the flat of the gun all the way back through to the back, and we have three measurements. We measure the, the height at the comb, height at the face, which is the midpoint, and height at the heel. Um, and, and we measure those because actually the, the, the cast and the bend of the gun will actually change that, but also you need to know how high up the distance to where the face is to where the eye sits on the barrel. So what I'll ask Andrew to do to do this one is I'll ask him, I know the gun is empty, so I'll ask him to, to shut the gun and just mount the gun at, at 90 degrees or flat to him and just mount it flat straight out. What I do then is I'll come around the side and I'll just come around to this side and I'll look down the barrel. Now if you come around at this end you will be able to see that looking straight down the barrel, and if you can hold that there, Andrew, um, if you look down the barrel, you can see all of Andrew's eye and a small piece of his, of his eyelid at the bottom. His eye then is looking over the top of the gun and his perception to the end of the gun is coming down onto here. Um, and if I completely raise the gun up like this and Andrew tells me what he can see, what are you starting to see now? Just lots of gun. Lots of gun. Can you see what the end of the gun's doing? No. Not a thing. Right, so what we'd need to do in that instance is we need to look at the, the height of the comb. Um, so we'll go back to the gun um, and the keys. And what we'll do, we'll just, you, they're very easy to, to, to manipulate these guns. You just slightly undo the screws. Um, and just from my, my guess work, and it really is sort of guesswork, trial and error, getting some feedback from your, from your client. Um, exactly where they where they think it should be and obviously experience with the shape of people will will help um, so if you do the same exercise again if you can just mount that gun perfect and I'll just come around this end we know it's empty and come around and look at Andrew if I look straight down there I can see all of his all of his eye there's a possibility that the that the end of the gun is just covering the bottom of the color piece of his eye um, so what I think I'll do now if Andrew just drops the gun down a little bit again I'll just lift it a tiny bit. The tiny measurement will make a difference. Um, obviously, when everything goes up to to a further distance away, a few millimetres at this end can make a massive difference um, on the bird that is 30, 40 yards away. Let's see what's going on there. So if you just mount that up again, Andrew, and I'll come around again and just have a look. And I can see all of his eye there now. So if I lift his gun up now, and I keep raising it, and you should now be able to see at the end of the gun all the way up through, and even when he gets to this point where he's going to shoot his very high pheasant, he should still be looking all the way down the end of his gun, which I hope you are, Andrew. That's correct, yeah. So um, if you bring it back down and mount to the camera, you, the camera, you'll be able to see 
that you can see the full piece of his eye. You smoke that one. The fitting has definitely worked for Andrew, and we hope it's also helped you spot whether your gun is a bit rough on the shoulder. William Powell is keen to do more of these events for customers to come along, have a pop at a few good clays, and consider one of their range of guns. Now, if you love your shooting, you'll love The Shooting Show. You'll see a clip of it appearing in this um, cypress tree beside me. Next, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. Stars from rock and roll, sport and TV have been raising cash for charity by shooting and fishing at Meon Springs Fishery in Hampshire. In all, 16 teams helped raise over £20,000 for Fishing for Heroes. Sir Ian Botham caught his three fish limit in 10 minutes flat. Mike Atherton, David Bumble Lloyd, Glenn Tipton from Judas Priest, Chris De Marguery from Simply Red and Gold Cup winning jockey Sam Thomas also helped make the day a success. Hunter, Jeep, Hardys, Waitrose and Ely Hawk all made the day possible. George Digweed has won yet another European title, his second in a month. This time it was the European Fitas Championship in Portugal. George dropped just five shots entering a score of 195. Mark Windsor was second on 193. The competition attracted 800 shots from all over the world. This is George's 16th European crown. Staying with the best British shooting, and English gunmaker William Powell has announced the arrival of a new over and under model that will go head to head with the likes of Beretta's highly popular Silver Pigeon. William Powell's Perseus is under £1,800 and is targeting the entry level shotgun owner who wants something a little different. You don't want to turn up on the shoot and shoot the same gun as everybody else, really. So that's what we're doing with our William Powell's. They're different, they're unique, and uh, they're really good value for money. So, will the bad weather be bad news for partridge shoots this season? Rain during Royal Ascot traditionally means death for partridge chicks. However, game farmers are reassuring shoots that although the bad weather doesn't make their jobs easier, the chicks are safe thanks to modern rearing techniques. And finally, Kenya's wildlife crisis has worsened, with six of its dwindling lion population being speared to death by angry locals in a single incident following livestock losses. There are about 1,500 lions left in Kenya, and they're being killed at a rate of around 100 a year. Kenya does not allow any hunting, but so far in 2012, it's had 133 elephant killed and 11 rhino. You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Some really important stories there, I thought. Now, Corvids. And what shall we do about them? I know, call Simon Barr from Realtree. If I say it's before dawn on the morning of the summer solstice, you'll get an idea of how early it is. I'm joining game chef Mark Gilchrist on a crow shooting outing to minimise the impact they're having on a farmer's crop. We need to be set up in the hide within the next 45 minutes to catch the crows as they start leaving their roosts and heading for breakfast. You always find big populations of crows wherever you've got uh, pig farms, chicken farms uh, or dairy farms. That's where you get big, big amounts of crows. Or somewhere where they're fattening bull beef. They're always making themselves unwelcome customers. And when it gets light, you'll see what I mean. There's just patches here that they've just ruined. When they're doing what they're doing, it doesn't take long for them to make the crop, crop uneconomical to grow. Many will not realise the damage crows can cause to crops. These crafty corvids don't just keep to livestock farms, and the young crop we are trying to protect is sustaining quite a hammering. The birds are not eating the shoots, but pulling them out of the soil to expose leather jackets, worms and grubs underneath. We'll have a look at this later, but now I want to find out if there's as much of an art to crow decoying as pigeon decoying. Mark, what sort of a pattern do you go for with crows? To make a pattern, it doesn't matter what it is, a pattern doesn't make any difference. Anyone that tells you want an L-shaped pattern or a Z-shaped pattern, you're making it up. You just want a big area of decoys and a hole where you want them to land. But one tactic that works quite well with crows is a big area of crows. 
widely dispersed, if you see what I mean. So all the decoys 15 yards apart. Yeah. So what they do is they come over and look at it. I, I think, or well, I've got a theory which I'll probably prove wrong, wrong at some stage, is that it's, they don't look at the number of birds, they look at the size that has birds in it. So you're much better off with a sparsely populated area of crows that's bigger than, than more in a smaller area. So sort of more on the spread than the density. Yeah, exactly. Well, I've, if only I was as skilled a journalist as you, I'd be able to use those complicated words to explain what I was trying to say. We hear the cause of crows as they make a start to their day. With the additional natural foliage covering our real tree AP camo netting, we're ready for them. Mark gets a few shots off straight away and opens the batting. Mark takes the job of controlling vermin on farmland very seriously. I feel quite honoured I may also get a shot off. As enjoyable as this outing with a gun is, Mark is most definitely working. Mark, so we've caught up with a few now and it is very different from pigeon shooting. What would you say the, the key difference is when you're shooting crows over pigeons? Well, you need to be in the right place at the right time. So, um, this time of year you need to be up early. I mean, it's, even on a good day, it's all over by eight, nine o'clock because they, they find somewhere else they spread out. Um, the actual taking the shot, I think you need to be a lot stiller. They're, they're a funny bird in that they are more intelligent, but also, oddly enough, crows can be quite arrogant in the sense that once you've got them fooled, they can often think it's incomprehensible that it could be a trap. If you've got a decent enough setup, they come straight in and they can be very silly once you've got them in that position. Once they've taken the bait, they're in. Yeah, yeah. It may be midsummer, but the rain starts coming down in stair rods. We knew it was forecast, so why are we here? So, Mark, we're out on the longest day of the year. You got me out of bed at 2.30. Mm -hmm. It's tipping down with rain. Keep still, keep still. How on earth did I miss that? I, I thought you hit it. <laughs> no, no, but it was the first shot. I mean, that really was too pathetic. I'll start again, Mark. So it's the longest day of the year. You got me out of bed very early. It's tipping it down with rain. Talk to me a little bit about why it's important to come out in these miserable conditions. You, you know, you've just got to look after the farmer. I don't have a sporting lease on the 45,000 acres I shoot on. It's, it's all a grace and favour exercise. So the only thing I can do for the farmer is be effective or, or be seen to be making an effort. Now it's my turn, and with some learned advice from Mark on steadily swinging through these deceptively large targets, I connect with a number of satisfying birds. That's it, lovely. There you go, lovely shot. Come on, uh, far away. That's it, lovely. That's it. That's it, that's it, lovely. That's another really good thing to do, do exactly the right thing. Go up on it, and if it looks like it's going to make a better shot, just don't pull the trigger. Then get him, because yeah. you haven't seen. As the rest of the country starts its day, less crows come over our hide, allowing for just a few more shots before this crop protection exercise comes to a halt. We can now pick up the birds we've shot and have a look at the damage they've been causing. Each bird will probably have to pull up, let's guess, 10 plants to get a full crop, and there was a hundred here the other morning. Um, and it, okay, we might not have killed that many and taken them out of the equation, but the rest of them have heard us banging away. And as they fly over, they will remember, because they're clever birds, they'll remember the shooting and see the dead birds, and they won't come anywhere near it. Well, we've finished up our morning now. It's the summer solstice, so we've already taken a huge advantage of the longest day of the year. Uh, we've connected with quite a few crows, and Mark's now packed up the hide, and I think he's getting a little bit excited because... Uh, right, I'd, I'd better crack on. I've learnt a great deal on this midsummer management trip from expert Mark. These birds are far smarter than pigeons and take experience and commitment to effectively control. Fair weather shooting this was not, but to do a good job for the farmer, 
the smaller bags are equally as important as the big ones. Mark's been a great help and I have immensely enjoyed a fascinating morning with a management master in his pursuit of excellence. Having risen at 2.30 and stood in the rain for five hours, we both deserve a full English field sports breakfast and a large mug of tea. Staying with shotguns, how do you clean your shotgun the best way? Let's ask those clever folk from Browning. As you can see, this is an old gun, what's known in the trade as a nail. If you add water and oxygen to metal, it's going to rust. Your pride and joy will soon end up like this. Every time you finish shooting, if you're going to be taking your gun out on a regular basis, every week or every, you know, even every fortnight, just give your gun a basic clean. Taking the gun apart into three main components. Fore end, barrels, action and stock. Once you've removed any moisture or any surface dirt, spray the gun with a cleaning oil or fluid. If you use an oily rag, great, but you're putting oil back onto the gun every time. So if you remove any dirt with clean kitchen roll and then reapply new stuff with new kitchen roll or something similar, then you're not adding dirt and grit, which is going to scratch the action or the finish on your woodwork. Spray down the barrel with your leisure spray or any other spray. Get a phosphorus bronze brush, like so. You can get two size brushes. Obviously, for different calibers, you have a chamber brush and a ball brush. The chamber brush is for the slightly larger area where your shells go. Okay, give it a damn good scrub, and then push it right the way through. Push through several times. Okay, once you've done that and you've loosened any fouling that's in there, simply take a standard piece of kitchen roll, put it into the top of the barrel like that. Simply bash it through. Out it comes the other end. Has such a tight seal, it will remove most and then you'll find the bores inside will be highly polished and cleaned. You can then reapply a slight amount of oil just to uh, prevent any moisture getting back into the barrels and eating away. If you look after them, the guns will last you a lifetime. Now, we filmed that for Browning at the Oxford Gun Company shop and clay ground, and the owners of the Oxford Gun Company this year celebrate 30 years in the business. So they are throwing a party for the great, the good, the bad, and even the ugly from the shooting industry. Fabulous family. Made me feel so welcome since taking on the game fair. Thank you very much. If you want to see more from this event and you're watching this on YouTube, follow the link on the screen. Um, it's hunting YouTube. This week we're celebrating Euro 2012 and the slow collapse of the Euro by highlighting some foreign films, thanks to everyone who has sent in their favourites. Well, they certainly do things differently in Turkey. Bilal Arabachi, forgive the pronunciation, shows a woodcock shooting film where the dogs wear radio collars, the shooters wear orange and they carry semi-autos. If you can put up with the bad language, and I assure you Turkish is a bad language, you will find this fascinating, not least that they are out with a group called Yonkali Timi Nazim Öksu, which means literally Literally Orphan's Master Shamrock Team. Talking of Shamrocks, after a two month break, the remarkable Irish shooting documentary maker, which is punchy enough to call itself Cream Them on YouTube, has uploaded another film. Trialing a Spaniel's Journey is a short, sharp video about a gun dog trial with great filming, a sense of disappointment you can't see the whole thing, this is just a trailer, and happily, no cream. Now, we have made lots of good factory films for manufacturers, including Norma Ammunition, Zeiss Optics, and Browning Shotguns. And here is one from the USA by Ammo Mafuga products made early last year. It shows CCI's 2-2 Rimfire Ammunition Facility in Lewiston, Idaho, and it's very good. Of course, ours are better. Our friend and viewer Reich from the Netherlands is back with another favourite film this week. Forget pheasants, this from Archipelago NZ2 is peacock shooting in New Zealand. But the quarry is not important for gun dog enthusiasts who will delight to see a team of Chesky Fuskies at work. Good grief, can't we have a dog with a sensible name? So we have to introduce you to this channel called Dylan Dog 69. It's in Italian and is all about, well, not just catching enormous catfish and carp, but jumping into the water with them afterwards, splashing around, and it's hard to know what's happening here. Emotional continentals. Back to Blighty and air gunning. Country Pursuits TV has a day state Mark IV IS on test. Rabbits be nervous. He tries it out next to a tuned Air Arms Evo 2 and finds it almost, but not quite, the Evo can Evo's equal. Good work by Country Pursuits TV. Bad luck, those rabbits. 
rabbits. If you ever wondered whether it could be done, Big Size 66 shows that it can with the correct windage, elevation adjustments and surely a modicum of luck. A 204 Ruger shooting a 39 grain Sierra Blitzking with a muzzle velocity of 3,700 feet per second kills a rabbit at 458 yards. That's more than a quarter of a mile. Believe it or not. Let's finish on a film so painfully patronising and pointless, so moronic, so everything that's wrong with both football and ordinary telly. It comes from some sleeping beauty of a BBC producer who thinks it would be an awesome idea for the footballer Ian Wright to go hunting with the Kalahari Bushman. It must be a simple way, Jesus. That's terrible, that is. Yeah, go to the butchery and buy it. Somebody else killed it then. BBC Worldwide has the gall to say the former Arsenal striker is surprisingly squeamish when it cannot bring itself to show any of the hunting that takes place. Only right, blithering in the noonday sun, while men who live and die by what they catch and hunt are reduced to being victims of his otiose attempts at humour. It's the new Rethian principles, misinform, ill-educate and you will never be fired for hiring a footballer. It is television as voluntary tinnitus. Thank you for listening. Rant over. You can click on any of these films to watch them if you have a YouTube film you you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. We are, of course, back next week. And if you are watching this on YouTube, you'll see various things appearing beside me. You can click them and subscribe to our channel or subscribe to this show, Field Sports Britain, by going to our special shows page, www.youtube.com slash show slash Field Sports Britain. Or you can go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or scroll down to the bottom of the page where there's a box, pop your email address into that, and we will contact you remorselessly forever. This has been Fieldsports Britain, going bang and loving it.